don't know what you're going through tonight, but he is still Emmanuel, God with us Praise this God. evening. Praise God. He went up to heaven physically, but he still lives on the inside of our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what kind of storm you may be going through tonight, what kind of trial, but I can tell you what I'm determined to know in the midst of the storm. I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. That's what I'm determined to know, and I'm thankful that Matt Abraham preaches that that message here, thankful for the man of God that he that he is leading y'all. Uh, I just want to thank him for allowing me to come down here and be able to minister the gospel with y'all this evening. Um, it's always a delight to be here. Always sense the presence of God strongly whenever I am here. So I do appreciate the opportunity, brother man. We're going to be this evening. We'll be in the First Corinthians chapter ten. First Corinthians chapter ten, verse thirteen. We're going to read one verse, but then we'll go up before that verse and kind of talk a little bit down to that verse. And in just listening to the opening prayer tonight, I could tell that there's a lot of people that's going through things tonight. I mean, all of us, we always, we either seem like we're either coming out of a trial or we're going into a trial. But just listening to the, to the prayers tonight, I feel like what the Lord has laid on my heart is will greatly encourage the people here that are going through something and listen, even if you're not going through something, the disciples many times would get into a boat and all of a sudden a storm would come out of nowhere. Amen. So even if you're not actually in a trial tonight, you just never know when one might be on the horizon. That's right. That's so right. we still need to be prepared and be ready for whatever would come our way. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The Bible says, There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God. Amen. But God. But God is faithful who will not suffer. It means allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear or it speaks of endure it. Listen, no matter how long you've been walking with God from the youngest saint in here to the eldest saint in here. One thing I've learned as a Christian is that times of trial will come. Times of testing will come. There are going to be times that we will be tested. Temptations are going to come as a Christian. But there's two words that are on my heart, that have been on my heart for about the last week now. Two words, and that's but God. Amen. But God. But God. And I felt like the Lord led me here to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, because it says, but God Amen. is faithful. But God is faithful. Listen, when we use the word but, normally it's in a negative sense. Well, I could go get that job, but I don't know if I could do it. I could go back to school, but I don't know if I could do it. And we always use the, 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 the word but in a negative sense. But when you see the word but in the Bible, Amen. normally there's a promise that follows. And I see an underlying theme in the Bible as I read behind the major characters of the Bible in the major stories. And that is, but God. Amen. Let me give you an example. In the garden, the fall, Adam and Eve messed up, but God yes. had a plan and clothed them with the coats of skins. The innocent one had to die in place of the guilty one. We could talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fire. Didn't look like they were going to make it in the eyes of the world, but God. Yes. But God showed up, but Jesus showed up and was walking around with them in the midst of the fire. In the midst of the furnace, he wasn't just watching over them, but he was with them in the fire. He was with them in the trial. Yes. I got things coming to me even in my notes. I don't know how long we're going to be here. <laughs> Listen, I've come to encourage you tonight, ministering just for a few minutes, and hopefully an encouraging message titled, But God. Pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord. I thank you for an opportunity to minister here tonight. Lord, I pray that you would anoint me to minister, to preach, to teach, Lord. Let everything I say, Lord, let it be what you would have me to say, what the Holy Spirit would have me to say, Lord. Help me to get out of the way, Lord. I thank you that you would prepare the hearts of your people, that, that they would be encouraged through this word, and that it would produce fruit in their lives, Lord. We thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Listen, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, he points them back to Old Testament Israel, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. And he talks about how the, the, their fathers were under the cloud and how they passed through the sea. So I started thinking about the children of Israel 
as they were in Egypt in light of this message. But God, they're in Egypt for hundreds of years. And I hope you never get tired of hearing this. I talk about it all the time when I'm ministering because it's just too good not to talk about. But they're in slavery in Egypt for hundreds of years. No way to get out of there. But God, yes. but God raised up Moses and sent Moses in to lead the people out. Pharaoh would not let them go. But God yes. plagued Egypt with 10 plagues. And delivered the children of Israel out by his mighty right hand. But he told them to paint the blood of a lamb. Take the hyssop, shed the blood of a lamb. And paint the blood on the doorpost of the house. And when you enter in through the house, you're going to be saved. You're coming up out of Egypt. Not because Moses is leading you. But because the blood of the lamb is going to be on the doorpost. The blood that represented the lamb. Of God that would take away the sin of the world. And after they came out of Egypt, the Bible says that they left with all the silver and the gold. Yes. Everything that the enemy had taken from them while they were in Egypt, God multiplied back to them. Yes. They left with the silver and gold. And the Bible says that there was not one feeble one among them. Ain't nobody came out sick. Yes. Ain't nobody came out in a wheelchair. Everybody walked out on their own two feet with Moses leading them by the blood of a lamb. Yes, Lord. Thank you. And they get to a Red Sea. Oh, there's another obstacle in the way for the children of Israel. Looks just like our life. We get delivered from something and we get to another obstacle and another obstacle. And there's a Red Sea. There's nowhere to go but God causes an east wind to open up the Red Sea. They go through on dry ground, on dry land, and God drowned their past. He drowned all of the Egyptians in the Red Sea that day. And they get, so they're on the other side. Moses is singing praises unto God. Miriam is singing praises unto God. And the Bible says that they go a three days journey into the wilderness and they have no water. Another obstacle. Another trial. Another obstacle, another trial. And they get to a place called Mara. And Mara means bitter. The water was bitter in Mara. They didn't have anything to drink. But God showed Moses a tree. I want you to cut that tree down and I want you to throw it into the water. It represented the tree of Calvary, the tree that Jesus died upon. Yes, and the waters became sweet many times. Life is hard. Life is not easy. Life is not always sweet. But when you throw the finished work of Christ yeah. into your situation, the waters become sweet yeah. and they were able to drink there and they go a little bit further and they're murmuring and they're complaining again. They see the provision of God over and over and over. And every time another obstacle would come, they are murmuring. <laughs> they are complaining. And now they don't have no food. What are we going to do now? But God rains manna down out of heaven six days a week, enough on the sixth day for the seventh day. Yes. They had quail flesh in the evening, but God, yes. I see it over and over as I read their walk with God, but God, but God showed up, but God was leading them by the presence with his presence. Yes. So they go a little bit further. And again, another obstacle, another trial, they get to a place called Rephidim. And it means resting places. They thought they had got to a place where they could rest. A place that they would be able to take a little break from this journey that they've been on. But they very quickly found out that there was no water this time. There was no water this time. No water. I'm talking three million plus people. The cattle. People are drying up, withering, about to die. And I'm not just talking about like us tonight, you know, 30, 40, 50 people. Not, we're talking millions of people not being able to drink and murmuring and complaining against God, complaining against Moses. But God had a plan. I will stand before you there upon the rock in Horeb. And Moses, when you smite the rock, water is going to come out of it. And that's what Moses did. He took his staff and he struck that rock. And the Hebrew word is bakara. The, the, the rock split open and water came gushing out of that rock. I think about Jesus. Yes. And what he did at Calvary. And the water that came. I believe the water represented the Holy Spirit. But all of these things that they seen over and over. They saw the provision of God over and over and over. And they still would murmur. And they still would complain. Listen, verses 1 through 4, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. There's five advantages that Israel experienced. 
I'm going to go through them kind of, fit, kind of fast because you can go and read those verses if, if, you know, later on on your own. But number one, all our fathers were under the cloud. Number two, all passed through the sea. Number three, all baptized unto Moses. Number four, did all, they did all eat the same spiritual meat and they did all drink the same spiritual drink. The Bible says that that rock that, that, rock that they drank from was Christ. That rock that they drank from, even in the Old Testament, it was Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 5 and 6. Paul says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Verse 6, Now these things were our examples. We need to read these examples from the Old Testament, and we can pull truths out of the Old Testament that we can apply even to our lives. These things were written as examples. We need to not be ignorant of these truths. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. They lusted after evil things over and over and over. God showed up for them over and over and over and they still fell into rebellion. They still fell into idolatry. God was not the unfaithful one. The Israelites were the unfaithful ones. We are the unfaithful right. ones, not God. Amen. The text says, but God is faithful. Yeah. And look, verses 6 to 10, there's five failures that that Israel experienced. Number one, they lusted after evil things. Number two, they were idolaters. You remember in Exodus, I believe, 32, they were worshiping a golden calf. Remember, Moses came down and he burnt that calf. He ground it in the powder. He threw it in the water and he made them drink it. How they they sing in praises and dancing unto this thing after all that they had seen and they still fall into idolatry. It just doesn't even make sense to me. Amen. But do we not do the same things at times? I saw an article on Facebook the other day. I didn't even read the article, but it says when ball becomes bail. And I started thinking I, I could tell what the article was about. It was about uh, people or people with children that, that are in baseball or, 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 some, or sports and stuff like that. But many times we, I mean, it really hits home, but the things that are going on in, we've got Christian families that are showing their kids that it's more important to go to baseball on a Wednesday night instead of come to church. Right. Now, I'm not talking about being legalistic like you have to come to church, but I'm talking about like this travel ball and stuff where they're going all the time. They're teaching their kids that it's more important, baseball, that sports are more important than coming to church and growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and hearing the word of God and being in the presence of God. Man, that's idolatry. Yes. That is idolatry. Yes. We're not, we might not be worshiping a golden calf, but a lot of times it's like we worship in sports. Yes. We got enough parents out in the world that aren't Christians that their kids doing whatever they want. But then we got Christian parents that are raising up their kid to do these kinds of things. And if you're in this condition tonight, I'm, try, I'm not trying to heap coals of condemnation on you. I'm just telling you something that I'm seeing. Amen. We can't sit here and say, oh, well, I don't have to worry about idolatry. I'm not worshiping a golden calf. But think about it. Anything that we put before Jesus in our life, I believe, is an idol. That's right. That's right. Anything that you put before Jesus Amen. is an idol. That includes sports That's right. or whatever it is. Sports are good. I like sports. I played sports. But my, my oldest daughter, Catherine, she's three years old now, but she was in T-ball not too long ago. I told my wife, if there's ga any games, there was supposed to be, I think, on Tuesday and Thursday nights or Monday and Thursday. But I said, if there's any games on Wednesday night, I'll make up games. We're not going. I don't want my kid thinking that it's okay to put other things ahead of going to church. Amen. I don't want to raise them like that. That's good. I wasn't raised like that. That's right. So somebody maybe needed to hear that, or maybe we Amen. just had to preach a little bit on that. Number three, they committed fornication. You remember the Israelites, they went after the Moabite women. Mm -hmm. 23,000 people died in one day. Mm -hmm. In one day, they were committing fornication. And those other nations, like that, those heathen nations, it was drawing their heart away from the one true God. Amen. It grieves me whenever two people get married and this person has these values and beliefs and this person has these beliefs because the kids end up not knowing 
Well, where are we supposed to go to church? Is mom right or is dad right? I see it over and over. If you're not married in here, I think most people are, but some aren't. You need to be looking for someone who has the same beliefs as you do. Amen. Number four, they tempted Christ. They tempted Christ. And God sent fiery serpents that bit them. And many of the Israelites died. They put God's character to the test. They were testing Jesus. And I think it's something because it seemed that God left them in the power of that old serpent. He sent fiery serpents to bite them. And number five, they murmured. They murmured. They complained. Even after everything I just went through with you and their walk with God and the provision that they saw over and over, they still complained. They still murmured. We're going to kill Moses and we're going back to Egypt. The flesh pots were always full in Egypt. We always had bread in Egypt. We always had water in Egypt, but that water was not supplied by God. I said that water wasn't supplied by God. That food wasn't supplied by God. That's not in the notes, but somebody needs to hear that. The food came down from heaven, the manna. Amen. The water that came out of the rock, God was their provision. God was showing up for them over and over. Listen, the Bible says these things are written for our admonition. They're written for our exhortation. They are written for our warning. We need to learn things from their walk with God and not repeat the same mistakes that they did. And that's what I believe the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthians here. He showed them that God was faithful to those Israelites in those first couple of verses, but they were unfaithful to God. First Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Listen, your position in Christ doesn't allow you to live in sin and not suffer the consequences and the disciplines. Amen. That's why Paul brought up the Israelites. They had all of these privileges that we just mentioned. They had all of them privileges that we just mentioned, and they still fell into idolatry and fell into rebellion. Listen, your position in Christ doesn't allow you to live in sin and not suffer the consequences and the discipline. The discipline of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Temptation has been around ever since the fall. It's not sin to be tempted, but whenever you yield to the temptation, it can become sin if it becomes an action. And it's not even that you have to do something because you can look at a woman wrong and commit adultery in your heart. Even Jesus was tempted, but he did not yield to the temptation. Listen, temptation in the Greek, it also speaks of a trial or test. Listen, during times of temptation, during trials, during testings, our fidelity is what's on trial. Whether it's a temptation to sin that's coming from the inside, from desires or from the flesh, or whether it's from outward circumstances like the trials that we go through, overall, no matter which one it is that we're dealing with, our fidelity is what's on trial. What does fidelity mean? Faithfulness to a person. Our faithfulness to God. Is what's on trial. Are we going to be faithful to him. When the temptation comes. Will you hold on to Jesus. Matt says it all the time when he's, when he's ministering. Will you hold on to Jesus. In the midst of the trial. In the midst of the dark time. In the midst of the valley. Whatever it is that you're going to, through. Are you going to hold on to Jesus. Will you hold on to the finished work of Christ. When temptations come. I know for me, at times, whenever I was tempted to sin and would end up sinning, I would turn something into a work in my life. Well, if I do this instead, if I read my Bible instead, well, then I'll overcome this temptation. No, I took the focus off of Christ and what he did. And I put the focus on me and gave strength to the sin nature. I don't even have that in here, but that was what ended up happening. Listen, or will you commit spiritual adultery? Whenever the temptation comes, whenever you're walking through the trial, whether it's outward circumstances or whatever it is in your life, are you going to commit spiritual adultery? Are you going to look to something else other than the finished work of Christ to overcome this temptation? Faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified gives the Holy Spirit the latitude to work and move and operate in our heart and in our life. The temptation don't always go right away. The trial doesn't always go right away. But if we hold on to the finished work of Christ and don't put our faith in anything else and we not commit spiritual adultery, I believe that the Holy Spirit will bring us to victory based on what Jesus did at Calvary. So you need to hang on if you're in a trial tonight. 
Your fidelity is being tested. Are you going to stay with Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Or are you going to look to something else? Are you going to look to another book? Are you going to look to some other person? Or will we get in the Bible and read the Bible in the context of what Jesus did at Calvary and hold on to God's redemption plan? Amen. Listen, but God is faithful. It doesn't say, but the pastor is faithful. It doesn't say, I, I know Pastor Matt, if you call him, he, I'm sure he would do everything he can to pray with you if you're sick or whatever it is. Brother Aaron or whoever it is. But it says, but God is faithful. Amen. Man will fail you, but God will never fail you. Yeah. It says, but God, not only the but, but it says, but God. But even more than that, it says, but God is faithful. Amen. But God is faithful who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Listen, escape speaks of an exit. It speaks of an exit. Yes, the way of escape. We just talked about it, the cross. Hold on to the cross. Hold on to the finished work of Christ. But another word I see in the Greek associated with escape is an exit. And one thing I see is that with every trial or temptation, there is a proper way to exit it. With every trial that comes your way, there is a proper way to exit it. And that's remaining under the trial in a God-honoring way to learn the lesson that the trial has come to teach us. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. It speaks of an exit. Whenever you read Way of Escape, it's like, oh, yeah, I could just jump on out of this trial. I could just jump on out of this valley. And I don't have to worry. I could do whatever I want to get out of this. No, 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 no. We got to remain under. We got to remain moving forward in our relationship with God. This word bear, it means to bear by being under, bear up. A thing placed on one's shoulders. I couldn't help but think about Jesus carrying the cross. Amen. And shouldering the sin of the world for us. Simon had to help him carry the cross. But still, I believe at least for a ways, he carried it. Yes. But he bore the sin penalty on, on the cross. If you try to face temptations and things in your life, guess what? By yourself, you're going to crumble every time. That's right. But... As a born-again believer, we have the power of the Holy Spirit enabling us, and He's helping us, and He's leading us, and He's guiding us, and He's teaching us, and He's sharing in the infirmity with us. Oh, he's not going to leave us. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Jesus, He sticks closer than a friend. Thank you, but if you try to take on these temptations or trials or whatever you're going through in and of your own strength and ability, all you're going to do is crumble underneath them. The Holy Spirit is there to help shoulder that thing and, and walk with us through it. Yes, Lord. Romans 5, 8. They got so many scriptures that say, but God, I started looking and I just picked a couple of them. Romans 5, 8. It says, but God commended his, commended his love toward us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Jesus. But God. I, I had nothing to offer God. You had nothing to offer God. All we could offer God was fig leaves. That's all Adam and Eve could offer was just fig leaves. That's insufficient to cover sin. That's right. But Jesus came and did what you and I could never do for ourselves. He paid the penalty for sin. And he broke the power of sin over our lives. Acts 13, 29 through 30. Yes, Lord. It says, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God, mm -hmm. verse 30, mm -hmm. but God raised yeah. him from the dead. Yeah. But God, Satan thought he had him. Whenever he was two years old and Herod ordered all the two-year-old boys in Bethlehem to be killed, Satan thought he had him. But God, mm -hmm. Jesus continues Moving forward towards the cross, and he's baptized at 30 years old by John the Baptist. And the, remember, the, the, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, but the, the Bible says that Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Satan thought he had him again, but God. Yeah. But God. In the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus sweats great drops of blood, I believe Satan thought maybe he'd have him again. Maybe he's going to quit under this. Now he's starting to feel what he's about to have to endure for humanity. But God, Jesus still continued moving forward. But God, Satan thought he had him whenever Jesus went into the tomb three days and three nights. 
but God, it says, raised him from the dead, but God. Listen, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. With men, this is impossible, but with God, I don't know what you're going through tonight, what kind of trial, what kind of valley, what kind of storm, how dark it is. Even if you're on the mountaintop tonight, but God. Amen. With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Look at Philippians 2, 25 through 27. Matt made mention of this in his message, I think, Sunday. I listened to the first little bit of it, but Matt, uh, Philippians 2, 25 through 27. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he who ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that you had heard that he had been sick. Verse 27, for indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God, <laughs> but God. Epaphroditus had went to visit Paul in Rome and he had brought a love offering or a gift. You can see it in the book of Philippians. He had brought a gift from the Philippian church, an offering for uh, the apostle Paul as he's in prison just to help ease his stay a little bit. And he falls sick at whatever point on the journey. I'm thinking maybe it was after he had actually got there. But it's like he didn't even take notice of himself being sick. It's like he was on a mission and I'm going to keep moving forward. If God wants to take me out, he'll take me out. But if he, if he don't want to take me out and he wants me to continue doing what I'm doing for him, then I'm going to make it. It Praise says, God. but God had mercy on him. You, he almost died of a sickness. Maybe you have a sickness in your body this evening. But God Amen. had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow <laughs> upon sorrow. Oh, thank you, Lord. But God. I want you to walk out of here tonight thinking, but God, I don't care what comes against me this evening or tomorrow or next year or from yesterday, but God. Hallelujah. That's what I want you to think about. Two words. I didn't say it a hundred times. Tonight. But God. Thank you, Jesus. you can't say it too much. But Thank God. You. Amen. I got a couple of testimonies I want to share with you just real quick. I'm not a big storyteller or things like that normally when I preach, but I do believe that when we share testimonies, I believe it can build other people's faith Amen. and what our God can do. Because you might be walking through the same thing I have recently walked through. But at a time in my life, I won't share much of my testimony because I have done so a few times here before. But for a season in my life, I wandered out in the world doing what I wanted to do. I was working offshore and I fell into a very, very bad depression. I remember being offshore, working nights, looking 100 foot off the bottom uh, floor of the platform into the water, into the darkness of the night. And I just, I could, I could feel the devil just telling me to jump on off into that water. The Lord don't need you. I'd have never even been ministering here tonight should something like that have happened. But God, thank you, Jesus. I said, but God, he showed up offshore on the platform. Whenever I bowed my knee and surrendered my life once again, I had gotten saved as a young boy, but as I grew up and got into college, I wandered out and did what I wanted to do. Help us, Lord. But God, Showed up. I don't care where you're at, but God, Amen. he can show up. It doesn't matter where you're at, work, tonight, midnight, you wake up, you can call other people. You can call 911 if you want. They're supposed to answer. Maybe they won't. But whenever you call heaven, when you say, oh, but God, I need yes. your help. Lord, I need you. I need some help down here. When you call upon Jesus, the Father always recognizes when he calls, whenever you call upon his beloved son, and he will always send out the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit. He is coming right away. You ain't got to wait long for him to get there. He should live in you if you're already born again. But, but God, listen, my wife, I'd get her to come up here and tell you this, but I'd have to go home with one of y'all. She's not much into getting on the mic or talking in front of people, but that's all right. My wife was an alcoholic and a smoker. Started at a very young age, she was an alcoholic. She would drink the men under the bar. She used to work at a bar and she served alcohol and stuff like that. But God. Thank you, Jesus. I said, but God showed up. I don't know if you got a drinking problem tonight, but God. Hallelujah. God will deliver you from that. She had a tumor on her, uh, on her ovary. I think her ovary is about the size of a walnut. She had a grapefruit-sized tumor on her ovary whenever she was 16 years old. Her, her sister was never supposed to be able to have kids. And after this situation with this grapefruit-sized ovary, it wasn't cancer or anything, but she still had to have surgery. But she always knew since her sister wasn't supposed to be able to have kids, but God, she had a son anyway. Yes. But Hallelujah. my wife was even... It didn't take us too long to get pregnant, just a couple of months, like four months, but still... She did not know if she would be able to have kids because of her sister's situation and because of this, uh, this tumor after getting that removed and everything. But after four, but God, 
We got two beautiful kids. I said, but God, he delivered her and healed her. These glasses right here I'm wearing, it wasn't too long ago. I'm trying to keep these little testimonies short. But it wasn't too long ago. I had these, these glasses in a black case. I was about to leave to go to work one morning, and I forgot my keys in the house. So I set my glasses in the case on my toolbox, and my toolbox is black, so of course it blends in. I left, went to work that day, and I'm not one to forget stuff too much. Went to work all day that day, came back home. I showered, took my contacts out and stuff. I'm like, where's my glasses? I don't know where my glasses are. Start looking around, looking, looking. I'm like, I'm praying. Walked outside. I can't see because I can't see without contacts or glasses too well. I'm trying to look. You can imagine if you do wear glasses or con contact. Trying to look outside when it's dark for something. And I went back inside. I walked back outside praying, Lord, where are they at? I walked to my truck and they were underneath my truck. And the case was smashed. I'm talking about that thing looked like a pancake. I'm like, and it's Christmas time. You know, we buy gifts for, for the family and stuff like that. I'm like, surely I don't need to be buying no new glasses right now. You know, I know it's just a material thing, but still, yeah. I would have had to buy them. Man, I all picked up that case and I pulled them glasses out. They ain't had a scratch on them. I said, but God, Amen. even in the little things, Amen. even in the little things, but God, he saved me some money. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Absolutely. Me and Catherine, this is a little bit bigger of a deal, but me and Catherine had went to, a, uh, the, this was right after the glasses incident. We went to a store not far from the house, a gas station, to get some food, and I didn't realize that the food comes with a drink. So I went over there and started fixing a drink. Catherine, uh, I think she, it was before she turned three, so I don't know. She was a little under three. But anyway, she's standing on my side here, and I mean all of a sudden, the loudest noise. Boom, I probably lost 70% of my hearing when it happened. I didn't even realize what had happened at first, and I looked to my right, closer than from here to the wall, I mean probably only 10 feet. This guy was drunk and he come flying through the parking lot and ran into the glass. Oh. Dead even with me and my daughter. Wow. Now, had he hit the gas, he could have come straight through there and ran me and my daughter over. I said, but God, Thank you. already knew what was about to happen. Right. Satan could have had a plan that day to take me and my daughter out, but God said, I don't think so. Amen. That's my children and they are not going to be touched today. Thank but God. I had some termites that ate up a little bit in front of my house not too long ago. I found this the evening before I turned 30. I just turned 30 in April. The evening before, right at dark, I found this, this termite issue. I'm like, oh my goodness. The next morning I wake up, I turn 30 years old. The day I turn 30, right after I found the termite issue, I'm walking from my master bedroom to the bathroom and I hear, ksh, ksh, ksh. there's water underneath the wood floor in the master uh, bedroom. I'm like, oh my goodness, I had an interior water leak inside of a wall between my master bedroom and my master bathroom, and that water was coming out underneath the floor. I'm like, oh my goodness. On the day I turned 30, I'm like, Lord, if this is what 30 looks like, this could be a time of testing. You're going to have to help me, Lord. So two big projects at one time, it didn't look like anything was going to be covered with the termites, and the, my termite company ended up coming through and saying they would pay for some of the materials. But the water issue was a much bigger problem. And in all of my house, the, the only spot we hadn't redone yet was that bathroom. So if there was any spot in the whole house that could have been a leak, it happened in the very best spot. I wasn't looking to redo that bathroom yet, but I, the insurance told me at first ain't nothing was going to be covered. I'm like, oh my goodness. They ended up coming through with thousands of dollars. I'm not, I'm not going to say the amount. Thousands of dollars. Them two situations that just look terrible, but God. Hallelujah. But God showed up. But God help me. Thank you, we walk by faith, not by sight. If I would have been walking, looking at the situation, thinking, oh, I don't know how we're going to get out of this, but God showed up. Amen. And the last thing was just Hurricane Barry just a couple of weeks ago. I, I got my kids and my wife. We went around to the four corners of the house inside. We put some anointing all on all four corners, and we prayed over the house. We prayed over ourselves, first of all, Lord, keep us and protect us. Everything else is just material things. But I said, Lord, watch over the house, watch over the shop, and everything that you have blessed us blessed us with. And I mean, ain't nothing touched the house. Ain't nothing touched the shop. Had a couple little limbs down in the back, small stuff. And that was it. I rode my golf cart around looking around after the storm. There was people with metal damage. There was people with shingles that had flew off everywhere. Ain't nothing touched the house. Thank you, Lord. Not, not everybody may have that testimony tonight. Maybe you did get a ton of rain. We didn't get near the amount of rain we were supposed to get where we were. Other places did get a lot, but we was praying, Lord, watch over us and watch over the things that you blessed us with. But God, 
Sometimes circumstances and situations don't look good, but walk out of here tonight thinking, but God, but God is at work in my heart. But God is at work in my life. But God's going to show up for me. I know that he will. That's one thing stuck with me with Brother Lawrence and a couple years ago. He came and ministered a message title on Saturday night, Saturday night. I know that he will. Amen. Man, that stuck with me because you know he can. Yes. You know God can, but I, I know that he will. I'm believing God for the impossible. Amen. I know he will. Listen, what the devil tries to destroy you with, God uses to build you. He's building Christ's likeness into you, but through the trial, many times it's in the trial that we find out, oh, that word came out of my mouth. I thought I was delivered from all that cussing thing. I didn't realize that I was going to start murmuring. I didn't realize I was going to start complaining until we get into the trial and fall down in the valley. Everything's easy when you're on the mountaintop, but whenever you get in the valley, you know what happens? Right whenever you get in that trial, normally you hit your knees. God wants to keep us in a place of dependency on him. Yes. And a lot of times that's what the trial does. It keeps us in a place of dependency yes. on him. Does anyone else hit their knees right when the trial hits? You hit your knees and you start praying. Dependent on him. Listen, if you didn't get anything else tonight, make sure you get this. One day you will refer back to your trial as a but God testimony. Jesus. The Holy Spirit gave me that. I don't know who that's for. Maybe it's for everybody in here. Thank you, Lord. Maybe it's for something you're not even going through yet. Maybe it's something that's going to start next month. Maybe it's something that's going to start next year. Whenever it is that it's going to be, or maybe you're in, in that season of your life right now where you're being tried. Your fidelity is being tried. One day you will refer back to your trial yeah. as a but God testimony. Hallelujah. You can say, you know what? It didn't look good, but God showed up. My child wandered off for a season. I did it, but God Thank showed you. up. But God kept him. But God kept her. Thank you, Lord. Whatever it is that you're going through, I want you to walk out of here tonight remembering in your heart, in your mind, whatever. But God. I can't say it enough. But God is faithful, the text said. But God is faithful. Hallelujah. He is faithful. Yeah. Amen.